Well, welcome everybody that's here at the moment. We're early, but we might um, make a start so we don't run behind time. Um, first of all, I'll explain today. You should have up on your screens the uh, order of proceedings and the um, times and various things that are required. Um, if you need to go into Slido, it's at the bottom of the uh, list there. You use Resilience Band Star. There's a co there is a uh, survey in there which would be very handy if you would fill out so that we can work out how we can um, service you and what, what level of things you would like, whether we can um, do anything for uh, this area. Um, we'll just wait a few minutes. Um, this morning you will be hearing from Wendy Cohen, who is our Chief Executive Officer, and she will be explaining very briefly the, um, the uh, sort of the goals and aspirations of Farmers for Climate Action, <clears throat> how we go about it, and what we're trying to do for our farmer members. We'll then have Dr. Rob Gordon, who is a clinical psychologist practiced in um, disaster resilience and recovery. And he will give us a very interesting talk on what happens to people and communities in disasters. And then we'll have Lorraine Gordon, who is um, the CEO of Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. And she will, she's actually should have a very interesting story because she was burnt out um, last year in Lismore. Um, and so she will be talking about how that affected her, her property, and how she's using regenerative agriculture to recover. And then finally, we will have Dennis Ginnivan. Dennis is a past foundation member of Voices for Endi, and he's going to um, talk about how that was set up, the point of it being set up, and how we might do a similar thing in the uh, Gippsland region to give a voice to the community and make sure they can be heard in any deliberations they have with their local government, state government or federal government. Uh, and it also, you know, those sorts of groups can do many other things besides talk to government. They might actually um, help the community become more resilient as well. So given that, um, it's now almost 10 to nine and Wendy is with us. Um, I might welcome Wendy to the uh, forum, Gippsland Forum. And uh, I can't hear you, Wendy. Um, oh, now I can. Now? now I can, yes, that's right, fine. Right. You can hear and see me, I trust. I can see you, yes, and I can hear you. So we'll have my hand over to you, Wendy, and um, we will commence the forum. Good morning, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to you all. Um, probably quite a chilly morning in most parts of the country at the moment. Uh, thank you all so much for attending our Community Resilience Forum, which has been run today for the communities of the Gibson region in Victoria. Farmers for Climate Action uh, welcomes you to what I'm sure will be a very interesting and stimulating series of discussions. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Guni Kearney people. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, uh, uh, people and pay respects to leaders past, present and future. And indeed, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all of the lands on which we live across the country, given that we're meeting virtually today. Farmers for Climate Action is an organisation which works with farmers and their communities across rural and regional Australia. We work with farmers to build climate literacy across communities and advocate for farmers taking climate action. Ours is a grassroots movement and we work closely with farmers to identify and implement measures on and off farm to tackle climate change and also to empower communities to work with low carbon solutions, adaptation and mitigation strategies to help create a sustainable and thriving rural and regional Australia. When we speak of community resilience and the power of a connected and strong community, we look no further than to the communities of Gippsland. Across Australia, we have witnessed your resilience 
in the face of the most confronting and terrible crisis over summer with the bushfires. These bushfires are an incredibly stark reminder of the devastating impacts of climate change. And your response has been a vivid and compelling demonstration of what a community can achieve to overcome the most horrific challenges. And now with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, you're again showing that you are resilient and innovative and connected. And Farmers for Climate Action is helping to bring you some expert advice and practical steps to support your response, recovery, and how you might consider taking action against climate change. Dr. Rob Gordon, Lorraine Gordon, and Dennis Ginevan will um, lead fascinating discussions. And I thank them all so much for their time and expertise. I'd also like to thank the team uh, at, at FCA for pulling uh, this uh, forum and, and uh, other forums that we've been running in the series um, and any board members of FCA attending today. After the speakers, we'll be touching on some ways you can connect within your community and demonstrate your support for building even stronger communities, calling for our leaders to address climate change and supporting uh, a thriving and uh, rural and regional Australia into the future. Enjoy the forum, everyone. Thank you, Wendy. Um, now, if I can just keep this under control, we'll be right. Um, right, um, now we'll hear from um, Dr. Rob Gordon. As I said before, and for those that have just joined us lately, uh, Rob is a clinical psychologist. Uh, he has an extensive experience in disaster recovery. He worked in the um, Marysville Black Saturday area. He's worked in the Christchurch earthquakes and many, many others. So the point of the talk this morning uh, for Rob is to explain to the community how they personally are impacted from a psychological point of view and how their community is impacted. And then hopefully once that is better understood, we can then set about building resilience. So I'll hand over to you, Rob. Thanks, Peter. Uh, good morning, everybody in Gippsland. Uh, I've spent a bit of time down there earlier on in the year, and I'm sure I'll be back when we can. Uh, just to put my work into context, uh, I began as a part of a children's hospital team going to the Macedon area in 1983 and I travelled to that area for four years uh, following through the recovery and uh, halfway through that time we had the central Victorian fires around Maryborough and I found myself going to two different communities who were two years apart in their recovery. And that's when I began to see some common themes. And as I worked with individuals and then attended some of the network meetings and uh, just talked to people in the street, began to see things echoing from one person to another. And there were rhythms discernible in the, in the activities that were going on, the things that were happening. And this made me start to question what's going on here in the big picture in the community as a whole. I hadn't been taught anything about that in my psychology training. In fact, I wasn't taught a great deal in my psychology training, but, but I had to go away and do a whole lot of reading. And, and what I want to share with you is a, is a, a picture that I've formed. It's a, it's a generalized picture, so it's never exactly right for any particular community, but really of certain inevitable processes that unfold whenever some kind of dramatic threatening event impacts on the community as a whole. It's the same for families, workplaces or whatever. It's any social system. And uh, I think there are some very predictable things which if we understand, helps us to sort of step back from them and not get caught them up, up in them ourselves, but also to anticipate what's coming and try and engage in a constructive uh, participation in the process because we've got this choice of things can either be constructive or destructive depending on how we get caught up in them and that produces either resilience which is the constructive side or I've had to invent a word desilience desilience the opposite to resilience when things get worse and worse 
And what I've noticed is that for many, many people, what will determine the long-term outcome of the impact of the disaster is not what happened on the day. Most people will eventually get a house again and so on. It's what happens in the next 18 months to two years. How well are you able to look after yourself, your family, your connections, so that when you do get all your stuff replaced and get out the other end with a, a life plan, you actually got all the things you can't replace, your health, your relationship, your children and so on. That's really, to my mind, the important thing about recovery. Uh, because we know that eventually, however frustrating it is, people will eventually get their, uh, their houses rebuilt in some form or another. <clears throat> uh, but we've got to look after the other things. So I'm going to share my, uh, share my screen with you and uh, present you some slides. Um, and I'll just need a moment to get them sorted. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Now, now uh, please uh, <clears throat> let me know if that's the right presentation. Is that right? The right way around? Anyone? Yes, that's correct. That is up the right way and it looks good. Thank you. So let's start with the, the general community. We all live in communities or social groups of some sort. And in these social groups, we can intuitively map them. And we can map them according to the closeness <coughs> uh, of our connections. And these are dots are, are people, they could even be families. The lines representing uh, the bonds, the social attachments, the social connections that bind people together in relatively stable relationships. And the important point is the expression of community bonds and any relationship for that matter is communication. The co communication is a material process. The only way th something gets from my mind to your mind is if I find some way of uh, expressing that in a way that you can detect. So these communication bonds actually describe the map of the community. And those people we communicate with most give us a sense of belonging and a sense of identity so that we see ourselves as in different groups. I'm sorry that picture disappears all the time, but I can't do anything about it. Uh, so we get this picture that we're in a crystal structure, if you like, but there are many different dimensions. So I may feel close to my neighbor in terms of local issues, but we may not vote for the same parties or have the same views on climate or all sorts of other things. So that actually when we look at it, it's more complex. So that these four people feel uh, they've got very strong common issues uh, around let's say climate action, um, but the other people who live in their community don't. And so we've got, if you can just understand, I'm trying to illustrate how we've got many different dimensions to our community life. And in some dimensions, we're close. In other dimensions, we're actually far apart. Uh, a bit like they tell us, the astronomers, that in constellations, we look at two uh, stars that look as though they're beside each other. But if we were to look side on, we would see one is way behind the other. And when we're looking from here, they look together. So that when certain issues are being talked about in the community, it's all very simple and clear like we're having a community meeting about bushfire. But if we suddenly bring up politics, suddenly we find we've got different points of view or occupation or socioeconomic status or religious beliefs or sporting interests, etc. It gets very complicated. Now, this system is there being constantly massaged and, and uh, sort of adjusted. But the really important point is that the function of this system is to meet our everyday life needs in all sorts of ways. And what's important is that it has a whole lot of rules and regulations and roles and organizations, which mean its primary function is to put survival off the agenda. By that I mean, we can all wake up in the morning and I can go and uh, be a psychologist and talk to people and you can go out and grow food and uh, all the rest of it. 
uh, Wendy can run uh, a, an organisation uh, and without worrying about whether we will die or be murdered or uh, be swept up in a tsunami or something like that. So we've got specialists, we've got ambulances and police and plumbers to unblock toilets so we don't get uh, typhoid fever and so on. And if, if the whole system works, we can all just get on with what we want and not worry about whether we're going to make it through the day. So that's the important point. The function of our normal community life is to put survival off the agenda. And it does this in such a reliable way that we make assumptions that it's going to be fine. Now, by definition, a disaster is something that is completely outside of all of that. Uh, and I want to show you what happens to this social system that we're all embedded in with these strong relationships uh, once a disaster hits. By definition, a disaster is a threat to life and property, which has a community-wide impact. Otherwise, we'd just call it a tragedy or a trauma, which questions our survival and disrupts community functions, mainly communication, because the normal bonds are not adapted to survival needs. We try and do a bit to prepare with bushfire preparedness, for example, but when the huge fire storm comes, everyone's just trying to survive as best they can. Now let's look at what happens to our nice picture as the bushfire comes through. Here are the Labor voters and here are the Liberal voters. See how the people turn orange? They drop out of their, let's say, political interest to suddenly being somebody who's impending fire victim. And uh, it doesn't matter what uh, politics we have or who we uh, uh, barrack for or whatever. We're suddenly reduced to this common denominator of human beings trying to survive. As the fire front goes through here, you can see what it does. It sweeps away temporarily all the structures that were there because they're completely irrelevant. And instead, we just try and get through as best we can. And as the fire recedes, we're left with these highly charged, highly emotional, we would say highly aroused uh, human elements that have all been reduced to this common basis of survival as best we can. And when you hear the stories, and I'm sure you've got plenty of stories of your own, of how people will rescue each other in the midst of a fire. I remember the man in, uh, in Ash Wednesday who was evacuating in his uh, Datsun 180B through the smoke and uh, and suddenly comes across someone stumbling along the road and he opens the door and the guy jumps in and he's obviously saved his life. He never would have made it. And they ma managed to get out. And when they get out of the fire, the bloke says, oh, I think I'll be all right from here. And he got, hops out uh, onto the road again and, and, and they drive off. And he, he's never even asked his name. He, he's just saved someone's life and he's never asked their name. It's like everything stripped down to the most fundamental relationships. And I call this... Uh, a moment of social debonding. That is, we drop out of that complex social fabric that told us who we are, and we go back to the raw basis. Now, it's not like the Hollywood movies where people will, I don't know, shoot each other or tread on each other's faces and, and do all that. No, nearly everybody cooperates and helps, but they do very much the same, whether it's their nearest and dearest or someone they've never, never seen before. It's a matter of physical opportunity and fundamental human values. Uh, so it's not really a reflection of our social connectedness. It's just this very instinctive uh, basis. So that as we uh, think about this de-bonding, we can say the first thing that happens here is it disrupts the physical, emotional, social continuity, the connectedness. It's unfamiliar. We've never been through it, hopefully. So we don't actually recognize it because when we're in this adrenaline state, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, you're actually not aware of yourself. You're only aware of the problem. It affects what is constant, taken for granted, and not consciously experienced because it's the assumptions. My definition of a trauma is an experience that shatters a set of assumptions that I didn't realize I had that life is safe, that fires are not too bad, that someone will look after me or whatever they might be. And afterwards, the world is not the same. People get great anxiety when they experience smoke in any way. People in Malakuta were telling me that. 
uh, at a barbecue. Uh, children becoming very alarmed when they rock up to a, to a campfire after they've been through the fire and so on. These are post-traumatic responses. So the, the, the fact that we are totally focused on our self and our uh, survival means we're actually not aware of what we've lost. We just feel I'm very frightened, things don't feel uh, safe. And what I've learned is from this moment of debonding, when the threat recedes, the reversal of that debonding back into social connectedness is by no means automatic, immediate or complete. And it's not just a matter of what happens because mercifully in most of our disasters now, the worst doesn't happen. People don't die and get burnt. Uh, well, not in the sort of numbers happened in Black Saturday and may it always be so. But uh, we've got to remember that in the moment before you uh, escape from it, the question is, what did you think was going to happen? And we often find that the source of the trauma is not so much what happened, but what you thought was going to happen, because that's what you got ready for. And that's where the debonding is. Uh, we we can, uh, uh, can illustrate that with this very same man who was in his Datsun 180B with his two young kids, three, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. And uh, they, at one stage, the car banged into a stump and stalled. And he thought, I've damaged the motor. We're not going to get out. We're going to die. Uh, it, he said it got so hot, he couldn't bear it. In fact, it was so hot that when he leaned over the back seat to push his uh, five-year-old son onto the floor to shelter him from the radiant heat, he got second degree burns because he jumped in the car without a shirt on uh, in, his, uh, in his chest and arm from the heat of the vinyl seats. And uh, he was sitting there and he, he, he could feel this instinctive reaction. It's too hot, get out, open the door, get out, get out, get out. And yet somewhere his rational human mind came into play and said, don't open the door, we'll die. Don't open the door, we'll die. And so he had this haunting conflict in his mind. And when he came for counseling, probably a year later, this was the thing he had to work with. He said, I nearly made the wrong decision. I was nearly responsible for our deaths. I don't know if I can trust myself. And this is a very traumatic moment for this man. Uh, and we could talk a lot about uh, the issues that come out of that. But in this moment of debonding, as, as the threat recedes, People are there, they've dropped out of their social fabric and everyone's in high arousal. They all share this massive experience they've been through. There will usually be a group of people who leave the area straight away, but those who remain come together in a very powerful, intense set of communications where everyone's communicating with everyone about everything. That's what not, not what happens in a normal community structure. We talk to people about various issues in a controlled way. And that allows us to process information as a community. Where did you hear that from? What would he know about that? I heard it from the authorities, so et cetera, et cetera. But in this state, none of that counts. The most uh, intense communication is the most emotional communication. Now, I call this a state of fusion uh, to suggest the difference between the sort of organized crystal structure, if you like, it's like a crystal lattice, organized, purposeful uh, social structure with communication lines that are organized according to various roles. But in the fusion, all of that's gone. Everyone's come together like a plum pudding and everyone will talk to everyone about everything. Well, not about everything because they're only talking about the fire and survivals. And so this intense fusion state, we can see is a fantastic social fabric for immediate search and rescue and getting on with the with the process of taking care of community needs immediately but it's enormously powerful and people become welded together with powerful emotional bonds and so what we see is very quickly a boundary will form around that social fusion a boundary we were in this together we have done this we're going to get through this and then as the services come in uh, and they need to come in and participate if they get in a bit late as we did in Macedon, it was two weeks late, you have to puncture this enormously powerful membrane 
that's formed. Like any social unit forms a membrane. And if it doesn't have built in its relationship to the other systems, it closes in on itself. And people become in, involved in this intense self-sufficient system or it feels self-sufficient. People want to try and manage things themselves. Now, I think this fusion state comes about because of two things. One is the loss of the previous structure. So people have fallen out of their roles and everyone's improvising their roles. If some people have got a role like, I don't know, police or fire or someone with medical training, they'll, they'll use that in the fusion. But lots of other people improvise and do first aid and put out fires and all sorts of things that they wouldn't normally do. And so this intense fusion state involves a loss of the previous social structure. And it's welded together with these powerful emotional bonds of survival. In fact, people will often be on a high and they're so triumphant that they've survived. Uh, and there can be a lot of humor, a lot of good will along with the sadness and the, and the fear. But I think the important task of recovery from the community point of view is how does the community get from this closely welded, intensely bonded fusion state back to the complex multidimensional social fabric? And it's got to be, as it were, pulled apart. And I call that a process of differentiation. And it's not easy. And it has some risks attached. And I think this is the really important thing to understand because we all run around in this state very focused on our own needs or particular issues. If you step back and ask what's happening in this community, it's a bit like an ant's nest when you've stamped on it. Uh, everyone's running around doing things. Every person has got a purpose, but it looks chaotic from the point of view of the previous social structure. And so this social differentiation involves a transition from the fusion to a new sustainable long-term community structure because the fusion's unsustainable. We have to have different roles. We have to have an ability to be close in one dimension and far apart on another. That's what normality is. We don't all agree with each other, but we have to find common ground and cooperate. Uh, so we need to integrate old and new structures. It has to serve recovery needs, but also look to a new future. Now, what I've noticed time and time again, you can say it always happens. There is an inevitability about it. It's in every description of disasters I've ever read, is that as time passes, this fusion state comes under pressure. And what I've learned is that there is an inevitability to the conflicts that break out because I found that this has been documented in social science for about uh, 50 years, that when there's a need for psychosocial differentiation and it's not consciously managed through planned uh, de deliberate processes, it occurs by hostility, antagonism, competition, anger, and negative emotion. In other words, conflict is the default way of getting organization and difference when everyone's too close. Anyone who's had teenage children knows what I'm talking about. You know, they, they fight for their independence. They don't come along and say, excuse me, mum and dad, I've noticed I've become a little bit more mature lately. I believe I could take some more responsibility around the house and in return, maybe have a little bit of a raise uh, in my allowance and stay out a bit later on Saturday night. What do you reckon? No, they don't say that because they just, feel I can't stand my possessive parents. I need space because they have no awareness of their change. Now, I think communities are like that. In this heightened state, we lose self-awareness, but we become egocentric in trying out uh, to get our needs met. And therefore, as time passes, what we see is we start to realize no two people had the same disaster. Everyone had a different disaster. We all thought we went through the same thing, but one person thought they were gonna die, but the person next to them thought, no, this will be all right, I've been through fires before. The one's traumatized, the other's not. So the one who's not says, what do you, why do you keep jumping? Why do you keep carrying on about smoke? It's just a bushfire. Uh, and the other one says, my life's changed. I can't settle, I can't sleep, I'm frightened. I don't think I can live here anymore. 
or people who evacuated and lost their house completely but never felt in danger versus people who stayed have life-threatening, shattering, traumatic experience but saved their house. Don't want to live there anymore. But the ones who've lost their house say, geez, aren't you lucky? Uh, you've still got your house. And they're saying, I wish I'd evacuate. I would rather have lost my house. These are people, the things that people have said to me. I would rather have lost my house than go through that again. Uh, and so on. Uh, as people realise that this person qualified for this uh, grant and that person didn't, or uh, this person's insured and that person's not, or whatever it might be, all sorts of differences open up and they strain the communicational bonds, which to begin with are based on this sense that we've all been through the same thing and we find, no, we haven't. And I get angry and upset and we don't talk to each other. The way the government gives assistance if we're not careful, we'll shatter the bonds because it's split. Some people are qualified, some people are not. Some people get it, some people don't. And so what we see is that in the probably two, three years afterwards, a whole range of issues can slowly open up. It could be around the redevelopment and planning as well as about recovery issues. And these split the bonds and if we, get back, uh, step back from it and saying Bill Smith had an angle with Jim Jones, but, uh, and then look at it, we can see they had an argument about a certain issue, but there are many people on, uh, on either side of that issue. And you can often see how the rumors go around and people start to sort of divide according to the issues. And so what's actually happening here is that a differentiation is uh, happening, which is breaking up the fusion because that needs to happen, but it's doing it through a destructive methodology. And uh, this destroys friendships if people happen to find themselves on either side of, of what I call a cleavage plane. Uh, you know, cleavage plane, I get this just from uh, what I learned about crystals at school, that they're very strong, but there are certain planes in the crystal structure where the molecular bonds are weak. And if you hit it there, even a diamond will break, won't it? And we can cut them. So the, the community has cleavages in it, the differences, any differences. And if they are activated in the right way, you'll see the community split along those lines. And so the real function of the cleavage is to promote this differentiation. Uh, but they do, uh, do so along perceived differences. Healthy communities live with real differences. We don't all earn the same money. We don't have the same jobs, we don't believe the same things, we don't vote for the same, you know, but, but we manage to work together. And this is why the complex system says that if we disagree about one thing, we'll find another thing where we've got common ground. But when we reorganize it around the one dimension of the disaster, then if we have, to have a difference, it splits us right to the core. Uh, so these, uh, the way these are perceived, uh, mobilizes the different cuts across pre-existing structures, alienates subgroups from each other, they don't want to talk to each other, fractures support systems. You know, we know that the number one protective factor for any form of physical or mental illness you like to think about, this has been known from research since about the 1940s, is good social support. And this social support system is being fractured by these cleavages. Uh, and that impedes planning and decision making because people don't want to sit together and they don't want to uh, agree because you've got this uh, agenda and I've got that agenda. And that then uh, politicizes what should be a psychosocial process, politics, you know, pressure and power and alignments and, uh, uh, and so on, instead of the community coming together and saying, we need each other, how are we going to do this? So that if, on the other hand, we have the alternative view of the psychosocial differentiation being managed through shared communication and changed and adjusted social structures to allow for these uh, differences while holding together our common purpose. The cleavage blades lose their function. It's a communication task, I've learned. So that what we have here is this idea we have in Victoria, and this is part of national recovery standards, is forming a representative group in the community. And I know in East Gippsland, each community is doing this in their own way. It's very important that each community can do it in their own way. Form a community recovery committee. Encourage all the differently affected groups 
to get together and advocate for their particular needs, whether it be the insured or the uninsured or the people who lost houses or the people who've had other damages. Everyone's been affected, everyone. And we can't just say we're only going to look after certain people because the community needs everybody. So what needs to then develop is a disaster recovery specific communication system. And that is this green system of communications, which I've tried to show is just slowly developing here around needs. Uh, because the old communication system uh, serves normal everyday life needs. It, it doesn't quite work. So we have to build our own newsletters and uh, social media and so on. Meetings, community meetings are very important. So that this structure becomes the essence of what can gather up the intelligence of the community's needs and convey it to the various governments and other helping agencies because they will not get it right without sensitive community feedback because very simple they're providing a whole lot of needs that they don't normally provide so they can't do it on the basis of their routine behavior uh, normally governments only uh, meet the needs of relatively small proportion of the community. The rest of us try and deal with uh, government as little as we can. And so uh, they must have guidance. Uh, but on the other hand, there must be people who get to know how governments function, what are their restrictions and, and so on, uh, so that they can convey to the community why it's happening the way it is. So there's a feedback system. And when that gets going, we get this as the essence of the gradual transition to the new multi-dimensional social fabric of the post-disaster community. So this is what I think is of constructive differentiation. So we've got two pathways of differentiation, destructive one through cleavages, constructive one through uh, uh, community organization, community participation, validating emergent groups and drawing them in rather than going into conflict with them. New communication structure for recovery. A common fund of information that is constantly repeated and, and developed uh, that tries to compensate for the cleavages. Active management of social tensions and inequalities and consistency in relief and assistance. Uh, and we need community feedback to governments if they're planning a certain intervention to help them think about what it will mean and, and how it might disenfranchise some people. Now I've described this as though it's a series of tidy phases. Human affairs aren't like that. What they are is really they are processes. So if we have a threat, we'll get debonding. If we have debonding, we will actually go into fusion when we come out of it because we've got to get out of debonding. We can't sustain that. But if we're in a state of fusion and we can't actually realize we've got the differences, we'll have cleavages and the cleavages will cause debonding along the line of the cleavage, won't they? And so the cleavages will split and the two sides will go back into fusion uh, and so on. So now, uh, therefore, I like to really describe it as a steady state coming and going. And I drew this after doing some work in uh, Shepparton uh, after, uh, I think, not the millennial drought, the one before that, uh, where they, when I presented this model to them, they said, yes, we recognise all those processes, but they're actually all happening at the same time with different parts of the community. And I reckon that's what was happening in some communities uh, probably two, three years down the track after Black Saturday. And I think we really need to try and manage that process. And these are a few basic concepts to try and keep a track of what's happening so that we can actually actively counteract the destructive and promote the constructive. But I think exactly the same thing is at risk of happening in families and smaller community units as well. So we can come to a few principles. Preparation and planning reduce debonding because we, we know what we're doing. It's the degree of debonding that determines the degree of fusion. And it's the fusion that is the major cause of the post-disaster disruption, right? It's getting from fusion. If we can, in, went into debonding and went back into the previous social structure, that would be fine, but we can't, it's too disrupted. Uh, so we go into cleavage, sorry, into uh, fusion. 
the cleavages are based on perceived collective differences. Therefore, information about the commonalities that uh, people have on either side of the cleavage sutures them up. And we can create, and I've seen this happen, I could give examples of how properly, carefully planned and targeted community meetings, uh, creating certain uh, issues of communication with the right spokespeople uh, actually creates a dramatic change in the community tensions. Circulating information promotes communication, which facilitates bonds, which then promotes constructive action. And finally, group formation of all sorts promotes communication, so we need to work on that. Now, um, we can break this down to a series of simple strategies. And I'm not going to read through all these points. Uh, your, your, uh, the, the slides will be available to you afterwards. Um, uh, but um, basically, you can see anything we can do to prevent or terminate the debonding, pr bring people out of debonding, hopefully into an organised connectedness as soon as possible. That's what our Red Cross psychological first aiders are about. Uh, once. Uh, once we've brought people out of debonding, anything we can do to minimise the fusion by preserving roles and structures and get things organised instead of this highly emotional uh, sort of knee-jerk from one thing to another, uh, but really build in the, the basic connections to the long-term recovery priorities. Intercept the cleavage planes. If we've got fusion, we will get cleavage planes. Therefore, we need to network people who don't normally talk together so that they can cross-reference their information. We can pick up tensions and issues very early and then create some kind of uh, planned response to it. Uh, and it's going to be about information managing. Suture up the cleavage planes, and there is a series of strategies we can use, symbols and rituals and ceremonies and memorials and anniversaries. These are all incredibly helpful for bringing groups together. Uh, and finally, a series of uh, strategies to promote constructive differentiation. Uh, this is the essence of community recovery. Now, I just wanted to make a couple of points about the stress that's going on in the midst of this uh, <coughs> before we open up for a bit of conversation. I want to just blind you a bit with science. This is a graph where this line represents how well we perform on any task, how well we function, make decisions, plan, drive a tractor, whatever you like. And this is our level of arousal, activation, energy level. So if our arousal is very low, as it will be if we're really too depressed to get out of bed, we don't function very well. If it's a little bit better, but we're really bored witless and uh, we're yawning and uh, we're not really interested, we don't perform too well. As our arousal increases, we get interested and engaged. We get up to a certain point up here where in this zone of arousal, our mind, brain, body and so on are programmed to work at their optimum. This is when we do our best work. We do our best thinking, planning, uh, we do our best coordinated work, we're, we're able to get on socially with people and cooperate, we're creative. But if the arousal continues to increase, we start to get uncomfortable because actually our performance doesn't just increase, 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 no matter what the arousal. All human functions have an optimal zone and they have this bell curve if you measure them. And so the higher the arousal, the worse our performance gets. So here we're pretty stressed. This would be me giving this lecture if I was awake until 3 a.m. yesterday doing the, doing the notes, uh, you know. And then uh, when arousal is very high, we're traumatized. Trauma is when we're damaged, we can't process things. And if it gets really high, we go into shock and we can't function at all. So a good thing to think about is where is a person on this, on this stress graph? After the fire, people are in this zone. We need people to settle to do their planning and cooperating and organizing. So it's a really important strategy because when you're in that high arousal, a first state that goes with deep bonding, I call emergency mode, 
is with adrenaline. And that's all about here and now solve this problem. It's about acute stress. Acute stress is I've got a massive problem and if I don't do something straight away, I'm gonna have a much bigger problem and I'm gonna be in trouble and maybe I'll even die on my house burn down, I've gotta get on and do something. And everything is focused on the here and now. These guys are rescuing a woman from a cinema fire in Calcutta, back when it used to be called Calcutta. And if you look at this man, you can see the narrow focus of his perception. They're just looking for how to get out of here quickly. When you ask him how, how aware is he of the environment, he's not aware of it at all. And so in this state, we can't do lateral thinking, long-term planning. We're only able to do the immediate thing. If you talk to people in the moment where they evacuate or uh, are getting a, a surviving a fire, they will later tell you they did the craziest thing, like a woman that rushes into the house, grabs her baby and her jewel box, and as she's going out through the laundry, she notices her husband's freshly washed white t-shirt sitting on the washing machine. Uh, and she thinks he's got a bare top, he's gonna need that. And she puts down the jewel box and grabs the t-shirt. And so the only thing she gets from her house is her baby and the t-shirt. Uh, now, you might say that was a good choice or you might say it would have been better to hold the jewel box. But anyway, that's the decision she made. And, People will tell you about the crazy things they do because what we know is if we haven't trained and practiced, we often don't make very sensible decisions because they're just made about this narrow sliver of experience. Have a look at the faces, how all these faces have a, a smooth, unexpressive intensity. What's not expressed is emotion. People often say they're, they're uh, panicking or they're terrified or whatever, they're not, they're in a state of arousal. This man is in a state of distress and grief because he has no role. When we harness ourselves to the role in adrenaline, all of the energy goes into the action. And as long as we can continue that action, all of that energy is being used. If the energy, if the action is blocked, the energy is blocked, and suddenly we get people breaking into emotion if they, uh, their role is, is stopped. And so you get this emotional turbulence between action grim, determined action, and uh, emotional loss of control. And we want people to get out of that, because you can see that this man has no awareness of himself. We you know, I often ask, what will happen if he cracks his shin on the tow bar of the ambulance? Uh, not that they have tow bars, I'm told, but, but you can see he won't feel it, because adrenaline shuts down all of the feedback systems. We don't feel hungry, tired, thirsty, or pain. And so, People will run until they uh, break down. And that's why the fusion is not a healthy state. Now, eventually, when we start to settle, even if we're still in the fusion, our threat is not still there, we move in to the second state where we've got a huge problem, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. You know, I've lost my house. There's nothing I can do to replace it today. Uh, and so we actually go into what I call endurance mode. This is a different state. It's the persisting stress state. So adrenaline will, will, will subside probably in days, maybe weeks or a week or two, maybe a month or two if you've got a lot of problems with insurance and grief and other things. But, but eventually you will stabilize and then you've got this huge recovery task. And the endurance mode is the state that most people do their recovery in. And this is lower level of intensity uh, where we actually can do anything that is automatic, routine, and familiar. But we can't engage in complex strategic planning or weighing up various uh, financial pro possibilities and so on. And we have to conserve all our energy. These two people are in cortisol mode cortisol versus adrenaline, endurance mode. They've been held hostage for six weeks by Filipino terrorists. This is just a photo I've got out of the paper. But have a look at the face. You can see the face in this state of arousal, like the firefighters in the previous picture, but it's not the same. There's bright eyes, but they're not focused on anything. Because when I'm sitting in my caravan, thinking about the house I've got to build, there's nothing to focus on. And so everything just goes around. And in, in cortisol, we, conserve to endure 
And what we conserve is shutting down everything that's unnecessary. Have a look what's unnecessary here. There's no signaling between the two of them. And so you can imagine that if they've spent six weeks in this shutdown state, that it's very likely when they get out of this, they'll need some help with their marriage to reconnect because they're in a partial state of debonding, aren't they? And what we see in this, if we're not careful in this endurance mode, there's a degrading and eroding of the bonds, of the connections, of the attachments. This is why I say it's in this state that we can lose what we uh, can't replace. And that's why we need to understand this state uh, and manage it to get out of it. Uh, to get out of it and get back to rest and back into that optimal comfort zone. Because there are a series of general stress uh, effects on thinking, and it doesn't matter whether it's adrenaline or cortisol. In effect, you are less efficient, less verbal, more able to do what you can see. You can't engage in lateral thinking and creative problem solving. You can't be flexible. Uh, we have simple emotional associations, very judgmental. We can see these communities uh, very judgmental with each other if we're not careful. Uh, it's not really a good basis for making the, the foundation for your future. And at the same time, in those stress states, we have these strong uh, primitive emotions, the hardwired emotions, fear, anger, distress, horror, disgust, as opposed to the socially meaningful uh, regret, disappointment, sadness, compassion, uh, gee, uh, I'm, I'm really, I can understand that although you didn't lose your house, you lost your garage and you had your, all your hobby stuff in your garage. I can, that's a really, it's very painful. I've lost everything I own, but I can understand that that's hard for you too, in a different way. You know, that's compassion. It's very hard to have that if you're totally in this high state of ad adrenaline. So uh, therefore, I think a very, just a couple of final slides, uh, it's uh, very important to think about the strategy of how we communicate with stressed people, whether it's over the uh, breakfast table or, or the, the back fence, if you've got a fence, uh, or at a community meeting. And the first thing is try and remember that curve, get them up to the top of the curve by bringing the arousal down before you try and tackle, tackle the problems. How do we do that? Just listen to them. Find out what they talk about. Find out what's on their mind. And as they're talking and if they're very stressed, it'll be jumbled. Help them clarify. And then slow yourself down. Be methodical. Explain everything you've got in your mind. Unpack the reasoning. Don't use jargon or big words, particularly if you're working in one of the agencies. And use the complexity of language, the words, the vocabulary, the sentence structure you'd use to explain it to an intelligent early primary school child, because the time we start to use verbal concepts is around the age of nine. That's when kids move from sums about apples and oranges to algebra uh, concepts. And so when you're in that stress state, it's nothing to do with your education or anything. You just can't process complex words. So you've got to translate it all into simple language. And this is a really important message for those people who are trying to support uh, stressed people, slow everything down. Now, two points on, on resilience before I finish. The first is I spent a whole half a day looking up what the word meant because I couldn't work it out. And eventually what I came to from the Latin, resilate to spring back. And if you look uh, in the, just next to it in the dictionary is sale, which means reads. Now I reckon that's a great clue. Uh, reeds. When the flood comes, it flattens the reeds and they're absolutely as flat as a tack. But when the floods recede and the wind blows and the, and the sun shines, they dry, they stand back up again. Why? Because there are certain core structures that can flex and deform without being destroyed. Flex and adjust and adapt and reform without being destroyed. Whereas the trees they get swept away out to sea and they're destroyed. And so what is it that we must hang on to that has to flex back up the quality of life, the meaning and value of things, relationships, family and community, all of the features that we can't replace. That's what we've got to keep our mind on. That's the core of resilience. 
And uh, I won't go through all of these, but these are a few points that have been identified in research. M knowing what's important, being flexible, preserving your positive mood. See, it's a very important, one of the best predictors of how well children recover is the emotional tone in the family. You know how the parents talk to each other over the breakfast table. And so one of my simple pieces of advice to people, all people during this long cortisol stage is just try and preserve your manners. You know, just be well mannered with each other, even with your partner, even when things are tough, just say please and thank you, talk quietly, don't yell, etc. That'll protect things. Uh, and uh, just try and actually keep getting out of the stress mode, prioritize time out. And a piece of advice to parents is very simple. Just try and give your kids your full attention for uh, whatever you can manage. If it's only an hour on Sunday afternoons, do that. Uh, and that'll preserve the relationship. If you can do it for the whole of Sunday afternoon, even better. If you can do it on Wednesday evening as well, that'd be great. And while you're doing that, try and maybe do that with each other and so on. Just, just, just be with each other. Just make time. You can't afford not to. Uh, and, and finally, this helps us to see that we can pair up resilience and desilience. I think it's a matter of self-awareness. Now, look, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any questions or thoughts. Thanks, Rob. Um, we're running a bit behind time, but you give such an interesting talk, it's um, oh, a problem. <laughs> uh, I think everybody finds it very interesting. So I haven't, uh, I'll, I'll make a list of the questions and we'll deal with them at the end. Um, but I'd like to um, now um, introduce Lorraine Gordon. Now, Lorraine is the uh, CEO. Oh, where did that go? There it is. Lorraine is the founder of the National Regenerative Agricultural Alliance. Now, that's based out of Southern Cross University. And at the, at, at the university, as director of strategic projects, she is a conduit between the industry, research and farmers delivering sustainable and regenerative agricultural solutions. More interestingly, perhaps for this morning, is that Lorraine is actually a beef farmer at Ebor and was severely impacted by the bushfires last year in that area. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Lorraine and, and she will take us through um, some of the issues she has faced, some of the uh, techniques she has used to attempt to recover and um, pretty much anything else that you would like to ask. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. You just give me a moment. Can you see that yet, Peter? Yep, yep. No, that's, that's all there. Oh, you that's, can? Yep, that's perfect. Fantastic. And that's the presentation screen? Yes. Great. It's got uh, your name and... Um, what you do and a few, a few um, okay. labels on it. Okay. Just give me a minute. Um, there, we've got some photos of some nice black cattle. Right, okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, technology, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, First of all, that was very interesting, Rob. And uh, I think uh, coming off the back of those fantastic slides, um, gee, I, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with you after, after all of this. Um, look, I'm gonna focus on a number of areas today, but as Peter's just alluded to, um, I do wanna touch on my resilience journey and that's very briefly, because in the last few years, it's been a, a journey of, um, a long-term relationship breakdown, 23 years of marriage, um, massive family health issues, uh, drought, being smashed by not one fire, but two fires from different directions, um, floods and uh, COVID-19 ramifications shutting down our whole business. So, and that's just in the last couple of years. 
So I'm actually told I am resilient, but sometimes when you wake up, I'm not always so sure that, that I am. But oh, look, I'm, I'm going to be quite honest and upfront and, and share some of my experiences. Plus, I guess, unfold what I believe the, and what others globally believe um, the meaning of resilience is and some principles around that. Um, and also look at where regenerative agriculture fits, what regenerative ag agriculture is and what it is not. Uh, financial opportunities, I'd like to look at that for farmers and enhancing their landscapes and actually offer some solutions and some hope um, moving forward in a changing climate. And also look at some really interesting and just very briefly emerging uh, research areas. And that's all then. What have I got? 20 minutes, Peter. <laughs> um, anyway, so here's, this is my farm at Ebor up in Northern New South Wales. And uh, we've got a steer fattening operation. So we turn off around 1,000 steers per annum. Um, we buy them in at 250 kilos, turn them off around 450 to 550 kilos, um, aiming for the MSA grass fed market. And we're 25 years holistic grazing and time control grazing. Uh, we've also commenced on the journey of farben, uh, carbon farming and increasing carbon through animal impact and density, correcting mineral deficiencies based on soil tests and multi-species pasture cropping. Uh, we've got a, a, quite a large ecotourism facility, facility accommodating, accommodating up to 55 people with a restaurant, bar and accommodation um, and using wellbeing retreats in corporate team building and, and use for that and regen ag education. We've also got cottages and cabins on our farm and we do guided fly fishing for rainbow trout. We're gearing up into quite a large aquaculture setup, um, turning off smoke trout off the farm and even looking at uh, other, other enterprises such as free rain poultry um, in uh, meat, meat chickens, geese and ducks. So, this is what happened in November last year. So I went from this, uh, these lovely green lush paddocks um, full of biodiversity and, and life and trees to the picture below, um, complete devastation. And I actually was lucky enough to cop not only the Ebor fire, which did about $950,000 worth of damage to our function center at one end, but the Lake Cadi fire that hit, us, hit the farm at the other end and took out most of our boundary fences. And uh, I was bunkered down between both fires, uh, lucky enough at the trout hatchery at, um, at Ebor. So at least I guess we could have jumped in with the trout into their dams. So what is resilience? Um, I'm actually looking at this pretty carefully and, and, and I can see where it crosses over in some of in some of Rob's presentation. But I guess I'm looking at resilience, not only the resilience of people, but the resilience of landscapes um, and, and our planet, to be honest. So here's an interesting definition. Um, the ability to live with change and develop with it. A resilient approach moves beyond viewing humans as external drivers of ecosystem dynamics. And as we all know, um, we're now in the period of the Anthropocene, where the biosphere is shaped by humanity from local to global levels. There are no ecosystems without people and no human development without the support from the biosphere. This is referred to as social ecological systems, where human activities fundamentally shape the functioning of the planet. And I'm going to sort of touch on what that means, but it basically means we we can very easily be and are in some areas at the tipping point. I'm also gonna to touch on what, um, what regenerative ag people talk about all the time and that's complex adaptive systems and that, that is the capacity to self-organize and adapt based on past experience, non-linear behavior and uncertainty. So here's um, seven principles of, of building resilience. And I'm going to explain some, some of them are quite obvious. I, I don't need to discuss what diversity means to, um, 
to the audience. But the other one, when I looked into this, had me a little bit baffled, and that's the meaning of redundancy. And before I start on that, you really can't understand resilience outside the context of your environment. The two, being both environment and you, are absolutely connected. Separate people from the environment and you will experience depression, sickness, and in other words, are non-resilient to cope with the change. So when we look at something like the word redundancy, and I just want you to be aware that there was a lot of academic debate around these seven principles globally. And it was actually, these principles were formed through the International Resilience Alliance based out of Stockholm. And uh, you can imagine putting a whole heap of um, academics in the room that uh, this is their area of expertise to come up with seven principles would not have been an easy exercise. So I've looked at them and I've sort of examined them from my own perspective and even from my own research to say, well, how does that stack up for Australia and what we've recently been through? So if we look at redundancy, you know, that's what that actually means is when several species performing the same function, um, actually there aren't several species uh, forming the same function. So if we look at something like bees, the lack of bees is a great example of what redundancy is. So if we don't have bees, there is nothing else to pollinate our crops. So it's not like we have a plethora of different insects and different species that can actually pollinate to the level that bees can. So that's what the, the word redundancy means. Beavers are another one. The role that beavers play in North America um, have an a really important role in keeping that whole environment in place and operating. You take beavers out of the equation, the environment completely collapses. So maintaining diversity and redundancy is essential. And from an individual perspective, I looked at this and I guess you could say family succession, so and, and having a succession plan for farms um, is what redundancy is all about. And if you don't have a succession plan, if you don't have youth coming through for your farm, then you can experience that redundancy. Burnt out carers, you know, who replaces burnt out the carer that, that cares for people? When they go, you have a problem, you have redundancy at play. Burnt out volunteers, same thing. We've all been in communities where, you know, we've had fantastic festivals and events all run by volunteers, but sooner or later they burn out, those festivals and events cease to exist. From a regenerative ag perspective, um, it reduces the reliance on external inputs of, of fodder, fertilisers and pesticides um, because we can ma maintain that diversity and redundancy. So the other thing that I found interesting in this, in this group of, of principles was connectivity. And it's, connectivity is really interesting in, in looking at what Rob's been saying. But uh, it's the way and the degree to which resources, species, social actors disperse, migrate, or interact across ecological and social landscapes. And you, know, you can look at something like COVID-19 um, as a fantastic example of that and how that could be managed better uh, by governments if they knew how that managing connectivity actually works. Same thing with the GFC, you know, that lack of understanding about some of these principles and um, the networks and the connectivity, um, I think, you know, had ramifications worldwide. So connectivity from an individual perspective, you know, you need to connect with others to produce not only healthy offspring, but uh, how we socialise with others um, to prevent loneliness and the lack, I guess, the lack of having a good belly laugh or the lack of associating with other people and socialising, you know, can actually, people actually die from loneliness. So I think that's, that's really important. And looking at all those those dots that Rob had up on the screen when, with that line around them all, you know, that is actually the opposite of what you want, as he alluded to, because you need to be able to spread that connectivity across different nodes. Um, another thing that was interesting was slow variables and feedbacks. You know, a variable whose rate of change 
is slow and therefore often incorrectly considered constant, incorrectly considered a constant variable. So an example of that it would be Greenland and Antarctica. Both of those places, when those ice caps melt, they're not going to melt slowly. They're just going to collapse, boom, overnight, they're just going to collapse. And so whilst everybody in government in particular thought everything was okay, it can be a very sudden, um, a sudden change. And at, at the individual level or individual perspective, if you look at something like, and may, many of you may have heard of the parable of the boiled frog, and that's when you put a frog into cold water and slowly bring it to the boil. It doesn't realise it's dying until it's, it's, it's dead. It can't just hop out because it's suddenly in hot water. It actually slowly dies. Now that's a horrible sort of concept to think of, but that happens to people. They don't realise that, that the temperature is increasing in their scenario until it's too late. And so in, in the regenerative ag context, um, we use feedback based on changes in the environment. So we're constantly looping back um, to influence what we can manage forward. We're constantly looking at our environment um, in the perspective of what's going on here and, uh, and, and how can we manage going forward. And it's, it's that ability to be able to read the landscape and examine complex problems with a holistic perspective. And so this gets us to um, this uh, social ecological systems are complex adaptive systems in point four. And the, that is the capacity to self-organize and adapt based on past experience, non-linear behavior and uncertainty. And a good example of that is a place like the, the Great Barrier Reef or Kruger National Park or even Yellowstone National Park. You know, they will constantly adapt and uh, it's not a linear behaviour. Um, it's, I guess, that fusion and that craziness is what uh, complex adaptive systems are, ever evolving and ever adapting, and we're part of that. And so, from an individual perspective, I look at that and I, and I, can, and I never forget Doris Day with what will be, will be. And that, that always sort of helps me, um, I guess, to put things in perspective you know, a strong belief in fate that everything happens for a reason and good things emerge from what seems at the time um, for many a, a complete sense of hopelessness. From a regenerative ag perspective, it's, it's really that deep, deep belief in the practice of holism and looking at things as a whole rather than in silos. So broaden participation, what does that mean? Participation, it's being active, um, that's active engagement of relevant stakeholders in management and governance of our social um, and ecological systems. From an individual perspective, that's engaging with family, close friends and networks in decision making. That's ensuring that you've got support. From a regenerative ag perspective, operating in a collective way in connected networks to support. Um, and then we have the last one, which is polycentric government systems. Now I have to say, what, what the hell is a polycentric government system? It's basically ours in Australia. We've got local government, state government and federal government. Um, it's multiple, it's nested, governing authorities at different scales. I would say the jury's out on that one. Um, that's probably the most questionable one of all of the principles um, of the Stockholm Group that uh, that I would put a big question mark against because only the future will tell whether our government system, which we have in Australia, is the most effective one. Mind you, they haven't come up with a better one as yet. So that's just a little bit of interesting information around what resilience actually looks like, not only from the individual level, which you went into in great detail with Rob and community level, but from an environmental perspective as well. So, I'd like to now just have a look at the journey that we've come on because it, it is worth looking at this, that these things have been, you know, we have been on, it's not quite linear, but it's, it's presented in this linear format. Um, and it, I guess it's, uh, it just shows that, you know, indigenous agriculture, of course, has been around for thousands of years. Biodynamics, we're talking about 1940s, 
Then came organic agriculture. Many countries have always practised organic agriculture, but this is looking at where we, can, where we have come from in Australia. Um, and then things such as permaculture, natural farming, agroecology, holistic management, key lime farming, conservation agriculture, always an interesting one. Conservation agriculture actually um, does include chemical application um, as well as regenerative practices. So uh, I think it's a little bit of a backward step on where we can head to because um, regenerative practice doesn't necessarily um, leave out the, um, the use of chemicals where needed. It just tries to limit them. And then of course, where we're sitting now is in this very exciting space of the potential for carbon farming. So I now wanna just talk about, you know, understanding problems and challenges, I guess, from a holistic perspective. And, and I think it's very important that, uh, I, you know, regenerative farmers tend to do that. They don't look at one particular issue. They look at what is going on in this landscape who do I need that may be a reduction of scientists or a specialist to come and help me solve this particular issue? And so the emergence of alternatives in farming um, has been a journey. And regenerative really is, has only been quite a popular term, I guess you could say, in the last few years. And I mean, I started some of my research into alternative farming systems uh, back in 2016, the word regenerative wasn't even used in this country back then. I'm now doing a longitudinal study, which I'll talk about later, re-looking at some of those farms, um, alternative and conventional farms, and post, that is now post drought, post climate change biting in, and the whole um, concept of regenerative agriculture. So the concept of holism, all living systems are made of smaller systems nested within larger systems. All of these levels of systems are whole and distinct from one another. And at the same time, they are dynamically interdependent and inseparable. And co-evolution among humans and natural systems can only be undertaken in specific places using approaches that are precisely fitted to them. Each place is a dynamic entity with its own unique history and future, growing and evolving, forming and decomposing, continuously influenced by the larger system in which it is embedded. So here's some definitions of what regenerative agriculture is. Um, I, mine's pretty simple, leaving the environment in a better state than we found it. Uh, interestingly enough, you find with regenerative agriculture, because it is a journey and it's a never ending journey, um, your definition changes with your journey. So each year you'll come up with a different personal meaning of what a regenerative agriculture actually means to you. Here's, a, here's a, what I think is a great definition. Um, interestingly, it's actually my son's definition of, of regenerative agriculture. But this is how he sees it. And this is based on his own research and his own experience. So regeneration is a, in, in a part a self-organizing quality inherent in nature, which many practices consciously or unconsciously encourage. This is a quality where every living system has inherent within it the possibility to move to new levels of order, differentiation and organization. While sustainable systems must maintain productivity, Regenerative systems go a step further in restoring what has been lost and improving what is currently there. Regenerative agriculture has emerged as an umbrella term for any agriculture activity that restores and enhances holistic resilient systems. It can include many old and new practices. An agriculture practice is not regenerative when it discourages the evolutionary and self-organization potential of a living system. So here's the problem we face. Um, and this was a great quote from Charles Massey, science and technology rules. So this has been the paradigm we've been working in for the last 50 years. It's a powerful faith in technology and industrial science, which holds that man can know everything in order to dominate and control nature, thereby further separating man from nature. And that's against the regenerative agricultural um, context is that an approach that transcends multiple knowledge cultures 
and is comfortable in ambiguity. Everything cannot be known or controlled. All phenomena is complex and part of an interrelated whole. So there's some different paradigms. One is that of the, the industrial farming um, of the last 50 years, and the other is where a lot of people are now starting to realise and move to. So here are some common regenerative farming techniques, and I'm, I'm sure you'll all agree um, that many, many farmers are already doing one, two or three of these techniques. Um, so there's nothing new, overly new in this stuff. Um, you can, I've bunched them into different colour codes because uh, just to make it easier to read the list. This lead list is not prescriptive. This list is not um, uh, a list that won't keep evolving. You know, we might find some of these practice, practices actually don't stack up in the future. And so some of these elements may well fall off um, and some of these practices may well not be used anymore. I mean, that's what's happened in the past. And that's the ever evolving nature of, um, of regenerative uh, farming. So there's a list and, you know, even some of our more conventional farmers will say, well, look, I already do have some of those things and that's great. What it is, is a journey to do more of those things. Um, the important thing is um, with all of these tools is that you don't put everything into place at once because once you do that, it's, it's like going into detox. You, you know, you're bound to go broke if you try and implement everything at once. It should be a gradual, um, a gradual approach, just implementing one or two different tools, seeing how they go, and then continuing on that journey. And all of a sudden, you find within a few years that you're there without having to go through horrendous detox, so to speak. So, just some simple um, pictures to demonstrate these things, um, you know, composting, biological control, uh, reducing chemical inputs. And I can't stress enough, regenerative agriculture isn't like organics. Um, organics is one of the tools of regenerative agriculture. It doesn't mean that you can't use chemicals and, and pesticides, it just means that you question your use and the need for it and the amount that you, you might need. Um, even on our own farm, you know, we still have a blackberry problem that we have to spray our blackberries. We still have liver fluke that we need to treat our cattle for liver fluke. So there are some things that there just aren't effective organic solutions to at this point in time. So that is a, a key difference between the two types of operations. Time control grazing, also known cell graze, as cell grazing, holistic grazing. There are subtleties um, between these practices, um, but basically they are all about um, giving pastures a rest and they're about stock density, which actually can lead to increasing carbon stocks um, within the soil. So um, definitely a regenerative practice, um, but yes, as we all know, there are subtleties between them and they are ever emerging. Um, in themselves. Things like leaky weirs, natural sequence farming, investing in wetlands, um, again slowing that movement of water um, throughout, throughout the landscape is absolutely essential uh, if we are going to retain the rainfall, the limited rainfall that we may get in the future, we need to make sure that we capture it all and, um, and don't lose it in our landscapes. Things like multi-species pasture cropping, um, cover cropping, green manure and under sowing legumes, highly effective, highly effective. You can see some um, radishes there, their, their roots go deep into the soil profile and can have huge impacts on actually uh, carbon sequestration and inc increasing carbon levels. So, and the more species, the better. It's all about biodiversity. Um, and diversity of species uh, across the landscape. So um, intercropping um, and, and not having those massive big paddocks of monocrops, which attract insect populations and uh, really put farmers at huge risk when we're talking about adapting to a changing climate. Again, there's the species diversity and just some pictures to demonstrate what that may look like. 
integrating enterprises, um, an interesting concept, but it's, and it's not completely a closed loop system, but it just shows that one enterprise can support another. And that's, again, it's diversity of enterprises within a farming operation. This is what, this is what gives farms resilience as well, is knowing that if, you know, one market falls over, and, and wool would be a very good example right now. Um, the wool industry, you know, has some stresses in it uh, because of global trade issues. So it'd be good to know that, you know, there was another enterprise that can support that family farm and that family business. So integrating enterprises um, certainly does play a role. And it also helps with eliminating waste and being able to recycle that waste within that same location in that same landscape. So just quickly, um, some emerging research areas, and this is the exciting stuff. This is the hope that I really want to focus on, um, for, particularly for farmers. Um, there is another enterprise coming, and I can honestly see in the future that there is the potential that some of our older enterprises, and, and enterprises such as crops, um, fibre, uh, livestock and so forth will be secondary to carbon farming. And uh, so the benefits people obtain from their interaction with nature is what we call our ecosystem services. And that includes provisioning, which is food such as crops and fish, uh, fresh water, wood, um, which is your timber, and fibre, cotton and wool, and fuel. So a lot of people struggle with what does ecosystems services mean? And, and I think this really does demonstrate it quite well. So it encompasses the provisioning of supplies for humans to survive, regulating, so climate regulation, food regulation, disease regulation, water purification. And then there's the cultural aspects, the aesthetic aspects, spiritual and cultural significance, the educational aspects, recreation, such as hiking and canoeing, these all form part of what we call ecosystem services. So how do we as land managers, and I include myself in this, make money out of ecosystem services? Because it's all very well that we're told we need to do this and we need to do that to protect, protect the environment, protect the landscapes. But when you've come off the back of drought and bushfires and COVID-19, you know, it's a bit of a hard call if no one's going to pay you to actually do that. And, uh, and that's an area that I really do want to focus on because there's huge opportunities there. So diverse environmental plantings, you know, trees or pastures to increase biodiversity. Well, why would we do that other than we want to look after our landscapes? Um, we want to be able to provide a healthy environment for our children to farm on into the future. But then there is that monetary value involved and there is a market mechanism in place and it's continually improving. I don't think it's perfect yet, but it is something that farmers need to get their head around. So biodiversity credits and offsets are going to be and are a real thing of the future and there is a market mechanism around that. Other things like increasing natural regrowth to increase biodiversity, restoring damaged lands, restoring riparian vegetation to improve water quality. Well, that all helps us make money and, and hits our, our bottom line as farmers if we have those things in order. Increasing soil carbon to improve soil health and productivity, that's where carbon trading comes in. And the thing about all of these things that are listed there, they can all coexist with our farming practices. So it's not, it's not an e either or, it's an end. You have to do this as well. And then in the future, you'll be more resilient, not only as a, a family farm, but your community will be and your landscapes will be. So ultimately, doing these things also increase your profitability. And now we have market mechanisms that can actually pay us to do the job. And so that helps with not only assisting with um, some of the climate ramifications, but it also helps for community resilience as well. So right now, there is a massive risk um, that has unfolded to lending institutions and insurance companies. And they are really worried to lend money to farmers. They're worried they're gonna go broke. Um, 
so they're thinking, well, how can we know if we lend money to that farm that's doing very well in this year, um, and say it could well be this year in front of us because they're saying we're gonna have a wet year. But how does that bank or that insurance company actually know that when the next drought hits, how are they going to stack up? How's that farm going to stack up? The way they're going to know is when the natural capital assets of that farm are in place and listed on the balance sheet. So they actually know what, what, what's been put in place to help that farm um, be resilient and that landscape be resilient in the future so that the likes of the banks um, can actually get their loans repaid and the insurance companies won't end up going broke. So it's no, the conversation is no longer going to be in the future about based on productivity and economics or GDP. There's going to be some new auditing standards. They're already in place and it's going to force companies um, to address climate risk. So that presents a massive opportunity for farmers and landowners um, to actually have their environmental assets listed on their balance sheets. So some of the areas that we are currently um, working on in the research is agreement on the methodologies. So we do, a, a number of us work with the Clean Energy Regulator and, and, and international accounting standards to make sure that Australia's um, measurements of this stuff actually stacks up on a global level as well. Industry specific evidence based indicators and quantification and payment of co-benefits. So we've got to make sure we've got the indicators right. And uh, again, this is ever evolving and it's getting better and better all the time. I think the sooner farmers hop on the bandwagon and, and get their head around this stuff, the more opportunities will present um, for those family farms. And of course, good um, scientific rigor and data behind all of this. So according to the IPCC report, um, you often hear farmers blamed at these incredible uh, levels, percentage levels for greenhouse emissions. When in actual fact, um, our contribution as farmers is only around 10 to 12% for crop and livestock activities within the farm gate. The balance is actually the, the supply chains and the transport systems and the manufacturing that goes into producing food. But that all gets mixed up and then we get banded with oh, farmers are responsible for, you know, 60% of greenhouse gases. Um, it just, it actually makes my blood boil when I hear those arguments because it's, it's lobbing us in to all areas of the supply chain, um, which I think is quite unfair. What though can farmers do um, to assist even with the 10 to 12% of greenhouse emissions that apparently we do contribute to? Well, we can reduce crop and livestock emissions. We can sequester carbon in soils and biomass, and we can um, decrease emissions through regenerative agricultural production. So, I'm not going to go too much into how carbon farming works. That would be a completely um, a, a different presentation. But you do need to baseline. You don't need to trade straight away or even worry about that. But you do need to baseline and you do need to register with the government when you do that. Because there's no point if in five years time you've thought, fantastic, I've increased carbon. Now I'm going to go and try and sell it. If you didn't in the beginning register with the government, you can't. Um, so you do need to, to make sure that if you're going to go down that path, you do register. Um, carbon prices are only going to go in one direction, and that's up. So at the moment, the government pays around $15 um, per ACU, which is um, the carbon measurement. Corporates are paying around $30. And Korea, for instance, is paying $45. So this market, like I said, is only going in one direction. So the longer you can hold off to trade, um, the better. And even if you found that because of droughts and whatever else might hit you in the next few years, you went to measure your carbon in three to five years time and it hadn't done much, you can just sit there, you don't have to trade it. So don't ever you know, lock yourself into agreements um, that inhibit you from making decisions down the track. So I guess the message there is there's both government and corporate markets out there for carbon. 
Um, and it's the regen practices which will not only help you to sequester carbon, but it does increase your triple bottom line uh, at the same time. It does actually increase your profitability when you get those, those practices right. Um, anyway, and that the research is continually happening around those practices and the methodologies. So I've talked a bit about um, my own area of research. Uh, so my PhD covers alternative grazing systems in northern New South Wales from a triple bottom line perspective, looking at the economic, environmental and social impacts of various systems and the resilience that stacks around those systems. Um, it's longitudinal. Uh, it's interesting to look back at the research in 2016 and now look at it, what, how it's unfolding with the same farmers um, in, in 2020. So look, I'd be, um, Peter, I'm happy to take questions. I hope I haven't gone too far over time or maybe I've made up some time, but uh, certainly happy to open up to questions. Uh, you're right there, Lorraine. Um... Well, we might, if there's any questions, people can put them in the uh, chat box to, in, in Zoom or they can put them on Slido, or I believe. Uh, if you um, put your hand up, we can uh, hopefully find you. It's probably best if you put them in the, uh, in the chat box or the Slido, because then we've got them permanently. Uh, I don't have a question at the moment, but anybody can think about what they would like to ask in, in about 20, 25, 30 minutes. So we'll move on to um, introducing Dennis. Now, Dennis Ginnivan, an interesting character, he's a grassroots political leader. And some of you may know, because you're in the sort of area that he works in, he is a past president and foundation member of Voices for Indi, which is a community group based in northeastern Victoria. And its aim was to encourage citizens to participate in politics and democracy, not if not party political, but just simply to understand how our democracy works and how they can interact with it. Dennis has occupied key senior leadership roles in three successful independent Indie campaigns, that's 2013, 16 and 19. And he's also, uh, I believe, still the deputy chair of Totally Renewable Yakandanda, which is a community group um, looking at the opportunities of renewable energy in their town, which is an area which I think regional Australia could have a close look at. So this morning, Dennis is going to explain the sort of work that he's done um, he's going to try and encourage people to become engaged and hopefully we will leave a pathway for you after this forum to engage with FCA, Farmers Climate Action, and work out how you would like to go from here and if there's interest in um, strengthening your voice in your region. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dennis. You're on mute, Dennis. Can you unmute yourself? Dennis, unmute. Why can we not get Dennis unmuted? Uh, oh dear, hey. unmute Dennis. There I am. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> Slow. That's all right. Okay. Th thanks very much, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say thank you, Peter, and to Farmers for Climate Action, just for the opportunity to speak with these other with these, with these other people and with communities around Australia. Uh, it's a very privileged thing to be able to do, and I, I, I very I do appreciate it. Um, just a little bit about my, my, more about myself um, before we, we kick in. Um, so I've, I've always lived in. Um, been on, lived on farms and farming communities. Um, I've been involved in some development of service models for farmers who are in financial difficulties. And so it's the people who are actually in, in, in uh, uh, at the edge of not being able to be in farming. So it's around that uh, part of 
the uh, continuum. Uh, I've been involved for quite a long time based in Albury, dealing with um, people who, who have had severe neurotrauma. So it, it just, it, Rob's presentation just sort of made me think of some of the, the parallels in a way, and that is where people are going through difficult times, um, family, environment, financially, there's a, a sense of identity that people either have now or may merge to some other point in time in the future where the, where the identity is going to be different. And I really like the, I just wanted to refer just very quickly to Rob's constructive differentiation, that term of uh, when, it, when it's working well and people are recovering from the difficult um, situation, the terms that helped to describe that were community participation, emergent groups, new, com new uh, community structures, and where there's been an active engagement by, by people in the community to deal with challenging times. So I should also say that I, I went through a, a bushfire uh, situation three years ago um, with a small farm near a little town called Yakandanda, which is in northeast Victoria. Um, and we, put, we, we lost everything except the house in that fire. Um, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge the difficulties that people in East, Gipps, East Gippsland communities, may they directly or indirectly, have been through in, um, in this last summer. Um, being from Yakandanda, we've had a number of challenges and also from places like Corriong in northeast Victoria, Upper Murray, the part of northeast Victoria, major challenges where people have been through some fairly uh, similar situations and, and recovery processes. So um, that's a little bit more background, background about for myself. So my job, I'm working with my little business is called Events That Matter and basically through that I'm supporting rural communities to have a stronger voice around and including issues that's, that may have mentioned, been mentioned today. The difficulties we face today brings opportunities to be, become more resilient. Um, and as, a, as I said, with the similar um, similarities between this part of the world and uh, East Gippsland, the double whammy effect of both uh, fire and pandemic have been um, quite uh, stark. Um, and so essentially what I thought I'd do just to sort of get the connection with the audience here just ask a few questions. You don't, we don't need to answer them just now, but to sort of get a bit of a feel for, well, why, what might this mean? As, as, you, as you're listening to the presentation, there might be some things that might, might, might trigger a, a sense of where to from here. And they are things like, are you, are you happy with the way things are going now? Do you sort of feel like that the, your, your community and the process are going well um, and um, your voice is being heard. Would you wish to take some responsibility for this if it's not the case, whether you can make things better? Would you wish to meet with others who um, may have a similar concerns? Um, or are you feeling daunted by that or too, uh, too busy or um, a sense of trepidation about that? So I'll be speaking today about like a case experience that's happened in, in um, Northeast Victoria as Peter uh, indicated in the Federal seat of Indi, um, uh, a group got together in 2012 and brought, came together around the sort of questions and issues that I've just been speaking about now. Um, what to, what, how can I, how can I be involved? What can I do to make, things work out better for myself? How do we make the, how do we support the relationship between um, our representatives and our, our community in a constructive way? So that group, which was called Voices for Indi, I'm no longer a member of that group, but I, I had a lot of experience with it. But I can strongly, strongly encourage you to look, chase it up on, on, the, on the internet. It's called this Voices for Indi, the website. It's got a lot of information about what's happened when communities get together. And I sure could also refer to you to um, this federal seat of in, uh, Warringah, which is where also there had been a community group that uh, decided we need to somehow find a way to get our own voice heard too. So the concept is pretty simple. And that is rather than be a sort of a passive um, 
uh, recipient of politics in your in your community, but to have and assume that right you have to participate in it and, and actively participate in it. So it's so really, it's I'm putting the the idea uh, as, is this something that you may wish to, to pursue? Um, I also want to acknowledge the, um, the work of the Victorian Women's Trust, who did a lot of work in the early years uh, around processes to support rural communities, to build, build those conversations in a respectful way to capture the information to I mean, politics can sometimes be a difficult thing to talk about, but, but community roles and responsibilities. And if it's done well, can actually bring together a lot of good information out of a community, which will help you represent your representatives, um, uh, listen and act on and engage with uh, your own community. Um, one of the big challenges that I think we, we all know we face is um, uh, the numbers of people in uh, uh, who are members of political parties has reduced. The Richmond Football Club, for those who th think this way, um, has more members in it than all of the political parties combined. So over over time, the increasing the situation is that there's a smaller number of people who are in, in those parties that are actually having more of the say about what happens. I know um, that you know, there's other mechanisms by which people can be supported and heard, but I think what, what is a part of a trend is, and that is particularly rural, which is where I'm working, is that the voice that rural people have can be diminished in the noise and particularly in, in, in the context of a party that isn't specifically listening to where you are, what's going on in your community. It might have a broader view, but not necessarily what's going on with people that you and people that you know uh, want, want you know, issues that they want to raise. So there's been, in a sense, a no, there's not been a door to participate in, or an invitation to, partic to participate in democracy, because if you're not in a party, it's been a harder process. And what happened in, in the federal seat of Indi is that there's been, that's been reversed to some extent where the community has been really, become really strong and active. Um, they expressed a lot of issues, they raised them, they decided that we needed to get better representation or find either find representatives, existing ones who would listen, or if not, uh, find ways in which other people may be able to do a better job. And in, in the case of Indi, it's been where now three federal elections have been, uh, have been uh, successful by an independent candidate. And so I think there's also been um, an issue for rural communities where there's been a, like a disengagement and really when we start talking about issues that have a generational dimension to them, they're not going to be fixed in possibly in, in, in each, any of us our lifetime, but we've got to continually focus on the ways in which we bring younger people and diverse, diverse, diverse uh, voices into the equation to solve some of these longer term issues. So it's not a 24 cycle, it's not a three year electoral cycle, it's actually generational uh, inculcating and putting into a base of uh, responsibility across generations and to bring people into that discussion. And I think people were starting to become uh, reactive to when they think, oh, yeah, all this is happening in my name and uh, what's, what's, what's getting done if it's in my name, but rather than what do I do to shape it? How can I get more active, actively involved? So I use the phrase um, shouting at the television, which is if you're not happy um, and there's no other way, may people can be just be, be cranky and disengaged with no opportunity to become involved. So essentially without, well, I won't go into all the detail of, of the processes that have happened, but essentially, when it, when it comes to a way forward, a way forward to deal with this, then in, in effect, the processes can lead to a community rising to express its voice. They become invited to express its power to shape outcomes. And, you know, for two, two examples at the moment, you could possibly, I would argue that this is around climate, energy, integrity, bushfire recovery, 
there's a lot of things that are out there that uh, communities have views about, but how are they being captured and how are they being enact enacted upon? So, you know, the, the deal is with a democracy, if the citizen has a right and a responsibility to be part of a, a democracy. And I know that coming through some really difficult times, it's, that's maybe just one more thing that people who have been through difficult times, such as in East Gippsland and elsewhere, that may be just one more thing. At the same time, there's an opportunity and maybe an opportunity to become more resilient as a community if that you feel that your community is stepping up to its own capacity and responsibility. Um, and without, again, going through all the detail, but what would it take? What would it take to do something like that? Well, in, in, in the case of um, this part of the world, a small group got together. Um, and it's important to understand, as I said before, that the a resilient community also needs resilient groups to be in them and to also to be represented by them, to have, to have an active voice um, back to your, your elected representatives. And so it's, it's, it's a way of actually seeing that your, your representation of your own community by, by your representative, sorry, uh, it can be stronger those representatives need that strong voice to help them do their job. Um, and these processes can help build the relationship between the community and the politician. And it's a two way street. It's not a one way street. And I think that's really the key message I'd like to get, like to get across today is that um, there's opportunities sitting there, uh, difficult they may be or new that they may be for communities to have a better say, a bigger say in what happens around them. Um, and when, when this group met, there was just a sort of a focus on, well, what can we do? How do we, how can we even have a say in this? Um, and that group brought together a, a variety of views and people representing a variety of other organisations in our federal seat. But the key, the key thing to do was to unite with a common purpose. So every group, every existing organisation has got its own mission and uh, goals and vision. But in order to bring people together, there's got to be like a movement towards a common voice and a common purpose. Uh, and, and in this part of the world, the community group Voices for Indi did that and, and also incorporated with a sense of common and understood and clear purposes. Um, I, think, I think what I'll do, Peter, is stop now because i think i've got the essential message that i wanted to make was to um describe the idea describe the possibilities and also to describe what it might take if a community wanted to, to um look at this further and it'll be very very open to questions or comments from people um in the audience so thank you peter that's great, Dennis. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I'll go into those in a minute. Um, whilst we're doing questions, um, Claire might put up uh, a slide, where to now, which has got a few ideas on it. Um, and we'll do the questions. You should still be able to see uh, speakers and the screen and whatnot. So the first question we have is, um, talking, I guess it's sort of written in shorthand, talking about cotton wool fibres. Where is hemp on the fibre scale? Um, and maybe Lorraine might be able to answer that one. Lorraine, is she unhooked? If I can. Sorry, can you just repeat the question, please? Um, well, I think it's about where does where does hemp fit into the into the fibre scale, but where does hemp fit into the uh, farming system? I guess. Um, yeah, look, hemp is a fantastic product, uh, but there are problems when it comes to the manufacturing side of things. Um, we actually don't have um, our experience, and particularly this has been a big thing in the Northern Rivers. Um, it's it's actually having. The, the equipment and the setup to be able to manufacture it. And that's quite costly, expensive, and, an, and it's not an exact science. And 
I think that's where it starts to fall down. It also can be tricky to get um, even crops so they can actually be harvested. That's always an issue as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there are some hairs on it, but you know, fa fabulous product. Thank you. That's answered the question, sorry. No, 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 I think that's done well. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, now we have another question. We seem to have a lot of questions for uh, you, Lorraine. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, what might be the best place to find out more on carbon farming, particularly some of the hard statistics on how Regen Ag helps? That came from Stephen Chater. Yeah, that's a um, that's a really good question. Uh, there's look, I will say this: you need to be very careful. So what what is actually going on out there at the moment? There are a lot of opportunists, um, a lot of sharks. Um, in the system, you want to be careful. When I just be aware and be careful of the aggregators. Now, an aggregator is basically um, is an organisation that brings groups of farmers together, um, which is a good thing, and actually does all of the work, all of the paperwork, or uh, and there is a fair bit of paperwork, um, and takes the onus off the farmer. Um, when they start going down this carbon farming path. The problem is with that is some will charge an upfront fee and less of a uh, reward at the end or a percentage of when you do start to trade, if you choose to trade, whereas others will charge very little upfront fee and um, quite a high percentage of success rate at the other end. So this becomes a real business decision, I think, for the farmer. Um, bearing in mind when you do meet these people, I mean, I, I when we went down the path, I probably met half a dozen different aggregators. Um, I'm very much a person that relies on trust and relationship building uh, before I go into any business transaction. But in this case, you're going into a business transaction that is very long term. Um, in many cases, at least 10 years. So you really want to get this right on who you decide to take advice from or information from, um, or even sign a contract with to do that work on your behalf. Um, it's a lonely journey to try and do it all yourself. I do think you do need a level of expertise to um, work through uh, the amount of administration that is involved in ticking the right boxes. Um, each farm will have uh, different practices they want to implement. The important thing is when you decide to do this, you'll be asked to do a farm plan. Um, and you need to, and a farm plan is not what you would think a farm plan is, but you actually need to come up with at least three different, um, different methodologies for your farm that are accepted in the carbon farming uh, government list that will sequester carbon. Now they have to be three um, activities that you have never done before. So in our case, you know, we had corrected our mineral deficiencies and we had put on lime every year, um, but we had never added gypsum. So on our farm, gypsum was recommended and we hadn't added it before, so tick that box, we can add gypsum, that's one of our, um, that's one of the processes we can use. Hadn't done pasture cropping before, so we can put that in as a new um, activity and hadn't put compost on before. That could be a new activity. We are also increasing our stock density. So just by increasing, if you're into holistic farming or, um, or time control grazing, you can double your stock density and, um, and decrease the size of your paddocks. That's also another tool that you can use because you haven't had that stock density before. So each farm's gonna be different on what their farm plan looks like. In answer to your question, I'm not, I can't direct you to a specific place, but understand that it's a business decision. You pay more upfront and then there's less of the success fee at the end that they take. And they can take 20, these aggregators can take 25, 30% um, of your profits at the end. 
or if you pay an upfront fee for all the advice and all the paperwork and everything, um, which in my case will probably amount to a couple of hundred thousand in the end over a few years, um, they may only take 5% success fee at the other end. So there's a huge variance. You need to make those business decisions for yourself. And I strongly advise you also bring in your accountant and your lawyer. There are tax implications and your lawyer would need to sort of look at that contract. And there is always, always room to move on those contracts. So sorry, a very long winded answer there, <laughs> Nita. <laughs> no, you're all right. Um, there is another question. Is your research similar to that done by Vanguard? I don't know who Vanguard is, but that comes from Jenny Robertson. Yeah, I don't believe so. Um, and I'm not completely across the Vanguard, um, Vanguard research. Most of the research that is, and there's not very much in, in this, this space, I can tell you in, in Australia, um, most of the research wrongly focuses on the economics of regenerative practices rather than triple bottom line. And, you know, that's an old paradigm. We've got to move past pure economics when we measure things because economics will soon fall over if you're not looking after your, your environmental aspects as well. So my research specifically looks at economics, environmental and social impacts um, of alternative farming systems. And whereas, yeah, what I have seen so far is, and you've probably, many of you may have heard, there, there is a, a bit of a debate going on um, with two organisations over a piece of research that went out and the, and the data was compromised and uh, that's got a little bit ugly, but it was, it's, I believe actually both are, are focusing just on the economics and that's not, that's not a good focus to have moving into the future when we're trying to be resilient in a changing climate. All right, um, and I've got one final question. Is there any impl implementation or integration of Indigenous burning practices? I guess they mean in Gen Ag. Oh, look, um, absolutely. So that, obviously that wasn't on my list and that's why I'd like to say it's not a complete list. Um, yeah, look, and, and it, it's interesting, like many areas have been doing cool burning and what they call savannah burning, um, you know, for for years. I know in my early childhood, that's I used to come up, we used to drop matches off, off the side of the horse in October when it was still in the cooler months and we'd have these mosaic um, burns throughout the bush. I'm surrounded by you know, forestry and national park. And, and that was just an accepted practice um, in, in my teenage years. And unfortunately, I think what's happened, um, there's nothing new in this. And, and what's happened is we've just forgotten that that's what we should be doing. And when I say we, I, I think, you know, a lot of the um, authorities and, and, you know, both national parks and forestry have stopped for many reasons you know, having those cool burns happen at a certain time of the year and hence where we've landed because of lack of that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a practice. Um, fire is a tool. It's always been a tool in holistic management. Um, it's a very important tool and has its place. And um, it also has its place in reducing um, rank rank grass um, and getting that new regrowth so that you can actually work on work with that um, particular area of the landscape. So it's one of the key tools in holistic farming is, fire, is, is managing landscapes through the use of fire. Well, thank you, Lorraine, and thank you to our other speakers. Um, now, just before we finish up and I call on Wendy Cohen our CEO again to uh, thank you all for attending. Um, there is a poll in, in Slido, which you can see up on your screens now, www.slido, uh, sorry, .sli.do. If you go there and type in Resilience Vandale and do the poll for us, that would greatly help us in trying to uh, work out how we can follow up and help you in the future. So I will now, 
um, call on Wendy to thank everybody. Thank you, Peter. Well, look, I think that was fascinating yet again. Uh, we have a couple of uh, the team members that are on and have been attending previous uh, forums and saying that they're getting um, more information each time, different parcels of information from um, uh, Rob's uh, um, presentation in particular. So it's great to see that there are new uh, pearls of wisdom and wonderful information we can get each time we are witness to these fascinating speakers. Thank you. Oh, you can watch um, Rob Gordon, Lorraine Gordon, and Dennis Ginnivan's presentations on our YouTube channel, which is great. We'll have them up there for you. Um, so just to wrap up, but we've heard um, of the challenges that we face together as a result of climate impacted weather crises, impact on the health and well-being that uh, uh, disasters have, and the ways that we can work together and as businesses and farms to mitigate the impacts of climate change. As Dennis outlined, working together, communities can create a unified and powerful response to help build resilient and sustainable rural and region, regional areas of Australia. Look, there are ways you can get involved too, which is I hope the reason that we're all here. Um, form community groups, for example, your networks and your structures um, to help take action in your local region. And this includes using climate smart practices and principles. Reach out to friends, neighbours and workmates and build the network, spread the word and engage with your elected representatives at all levels of government and help change the politics. Uh, Farmers for Climate Action has yard signs available uh, and uh, you can uh, be in touch um, with some of the questions or to request one of the yard signs if you like um, through info at farmersforclimateaction.org.au or through Facebook. Uh, the signs in particular are a great conversation starter and a really powerful way to spread the message. Thanks again for everyone for um, attending and um, I hope we'll continue the discussions that we've been having today. Thanks, Wendy.